I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce our lunch speaker. Uh, his name is Wes Jackson. He's the founder and president of the Land Institute. And Wes was born on a farm near Topeka, Kansas, and grew up to be a plant geneticist and a professor. And some of you folks know people like that. Uh, he, he helped start and was the inaugural director of one of the first U.S. environmental studies programs at Cal State Sacramento. He left academic life to return to Kansas and found the Land Institute, which strives to balance agriculture productivity with ecological sustainability. Wes is the author of several books. Hopefully we have some in our book room. A recipient of a MacArthur Genius Award, the Pew Conservation Scholars Award, and a Right Livelihood Award, known as the Alternative Nobel Prize. Smithsonian Magazine named Wes one of the 35 innovators who make a difference. So please welcome Wes Jackson. Well, thank you. You can tell I'm from Kansas. I got gravy on my tie already. <laughs> this is a costly tie, too. I mean, I bought this in Santiago, Chile, and was bragging on it to everybody. And now look at it. It's done. Uh, tried to put uh, lemon juice on it. It doesn't work. Uh, water won't work. and. Uh, my wife, who was born in San Francisco, will just shake her head that uh, there's no hope for us Kansans. Uh, we just don't know how to act in a nice place. <laughs> so, uh, well, I'm glad to be here. And I want to, uh, first of all, uh, acknowledge everyone here. The, uh, the University of California Vice President Barbara Allen Diaz, who I understand is uh, a Nobel laureate of sorts. And uh, so the academics out there, the farmers out there, especially panelists, policymakers, Rose Hayden Smith, historian that I'm told knows everything and has been to the White House garden. I mean, this is high company, and I intend to brag about it when I get home. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'm told that I'm to keep this to 30 minutes and uh, because they'll just cut me off if, uh, if, if I decide I want to go over. So I'm going to call their bluff and uh, see how this goes. But let, well, I will hurry along. Uh, the, uh, the idea uh, that nature is to be subdued or ignored began 10,000 years ago at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. It's drying out. The ice is retreating. And out of the Zagros Mountains of western Iran comes the wheat plant that we have today. Now, the wheat plant's an annual. And uh, I don't have anything against annuals as long as they keep their place. But to have to destroy a natural ecosystem in order to have a seed bed that will allow germination and then have to do that every year and every year and every year. That's like clear cutting every year and destroying the ecological processes. So this idea, this dualism that goes back to before the Greeks and the Hebrews, the idea that there is nature and then there is the human, and then the validation that nature's to be subdued or ignored is just ricocheted essentially through all civilizations. Um, the, uh, and I look at it a, another way, that when we were gatherers and hunters, living within the context of the ecosystems that shaped us, we were living on the contemporary sunlight 
that fell across the landscape, and there's so many watts per square meter, depending on where you are. And, but when we started agriculture, we got at the first pool of energy-rich carbon, the young pulverized coal of the soil. Uh, there was enough excess potential energy from those agricultural ecosystems to give us the kind of slack that would allow civilization to get going. And uh, first it was uh, the wheat, and then <clears throat> over in Asia, uh, rice, and then of course in the Americas, corn. But then about 5,000 years ago, um, also at the eastern end of the Mediterranean, is the beginning of the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. And uh, uh, we use forest carbon, highly dense carbon, to smelt the ore uh, for giving us uh, the bronze and the iron. And then, of course, the first biggie that came along was 250 years ago, so around 1750 or so, uh, in England using coal. And uh, if it hadn't been for the soil carbon, the forest carbon, and coal, we'd have never had Charles Darwin. And we wouldn't have had Einstein. And we wouldn't have had an awful lot of what we have today. And then um, we were using natural gas for lighting, but we started using it for power. Um, uh, there are three important things that happened around 18, uh, in 1859. Darwin's Origin of Species, John Brown gets hanged at Car Harper's Ferry, and Drake's Oil Well in western Pennsylvania. And I think they're all related, but I'm only entitled to 30 minutes. But we started <laughs> using uh, natural gas uh, for power about uh, after the uh, Drake's Oil Well. So here's the story. Nature's land-based ecosystems are largely perennials grown in mixtures forests, prairies, alpine meadows, and such. And um, uh, now, this isn't, this isn't me saying this. This is the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report. Um, agriculture is the largest threat to biodiversity and ecosystem function of any single human activity. So now the chickens are really coming home to roost. And uh, we've, uh, we've got, I think, this is the most important moment in the history of Homo sapiens, including our walk out of Africa, because we have got to figure out how we're going to meet humanity's needs and econo end economic growth and go negative. And that is going to be a biggie. And it may be we can't do it but we've got to be able to think about rationing. But if we can keep our food supply sustained without agriculture depending on an extractive economy, we can get through this long hump. And by the hump, I mean the, 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 the curves that go up on carbon into the atmosphere, the curves that go up in using fossil fuel, the curves that go up in uh, draining our aquifers, the curves that go up in pollution, the curves that go up in population, and you aggregate all those curves, and we're going through what contributes to that hump. And we have to ask the question, on the other side of the hump, are the renewables that we put in place, whether they're solar collectors, wind machines, whatever, or new crops, will they be dependent upon the highly dense carbon coming out of especially the coal, the oil, the natural gas? I think agriculture is the only uh, one of the disciplines that can get through that hump and not depend upon the highly dense carbon that has made it possible to get through the hump. And more on that later. So. If we're to correct the problem, what must we do? Perennial grains grown in mixtures. Why grains? It's 70% of our calories on about 70% of our acreage worldwide. So if you look at it here, you know, roots and tubers, 4%, vegetables, 3%, fruits and nuts, 9%, <clears throat> but it's the cereals, <clears throat> the oil crops, the pulses, 
that are responsible for 60%, that's on global. United States, it's more than 70. But of course, we have the cattle and pig welfare and then that nutty biofuels program that um, is taking a subsidy of uh, three times $1.6 billion per year. The $1.6 billion is the number I picked because that's what we need to spend over a 30-year period in order to get uh, perennial grains grown in ecosystems the way nature has it. So, uh, <clears throat> so here's the argument. <clears throat> How hard is this? Diverse perennial plant communities have been successful micromanagers of landscapes for millions of years. Humans are poor micromanagers of nutrients and water. So if you look at it on a global scale, on a global scale, the way the earth evolved primarily, its ecosystems primarily, feature perennials grown in mixtures, whether it's a tropical rainforest whose local genius is to receive water and get rid of it fast because water is a nemesis to fertility due to leaching, or whether it's a desert scrub, perennial polycultures, or tall grass prairie that receives water, allocates it, um, you know, again, how hard is this? During the Dust Bowl years of the 30s, the crops died, the prairie came back. So, uh, nature's ecosystems, uh, just to reiterate, generally feature the perennials grown in mixtures. So following nature, the ecosystem concept for agriculture would feature these perennials. And what this would do is bring a big new thing to agriculture, which is the broad discipline of ecology and evolutionary biology, currently denied primarily because of the nature of the clear cutting. We talk about agroecology, well, it's mostly agronomy. And agronomy is what humans do to mitigate disturbed landscapes. And there are certain ecological things that we put in, but it's not as robust as it could be. But now, it's a matter of the hardware. If you're stuck with the annual hardware, then you design the software to accommodate that hardware of, of, of the annual. If you have the perennial, now you have a whole different kind of hardware, and that hardware then will allow us to bring off the shelf out of that broad discipline of ecology to inform a research agenda. So this is the first opportunity to really have a marriage or a synthesis of ecology and evolutionary biology. Well, here's of course what we're doing. You know, we've got the greenhouses, we got the water, we got the spray plane, we got the tractor, we got, you know, the plastic that's put down. That's what we poor mortals have to do because we have to screw around with the deficiencies associated with annual crops. Uh, so, but look at this system here. This system here runs on contemporary sunlight, has no soil erosion beyond natural replacement levels, and with species diversity, you have chemical diversity, which means it takes a tremendous enzyme system on the part of an insect or a pathogen to give you the epidemic. It's a sustainable system, and this is a kind of system, at least out our way, has been there through all interglacial periods of the Pleistocene. Uh, the system we have is a Johnny-come-lately thing, the agricultural system. It's only been around 10,000 years, and now we're finding about 30 million acres a year worldwide going out of agricultural production, according to the United Nations. So, uh, we have a species that we call Kernza, after Kansas, Colonel, Kanza Indians, and also anything with the Z in it's memorable. Um, it's a thinopyrin intermedium that we're domesticating, and I want to show you that plant now. Um, uh, you folks are about to have an epiphany. <laughs> now the plant that is on what's my right, your left, is the wheat plant that started civilization, and the other one is Kernza, which is, has, tastes better than the wheat, 
uh, it's low in gluten, and this is a species that we'll be planting out 80 acres of it this year, but if we stop with the perennial monoculture, we've missed half the point. The idea is to begin to start putting this together in mixtures. Think of this root system where we cut it with the plow. That's carbon. In my view, the beginning of global warming started 10,000 years ago with the young pulverized coal of the soil, the living carbon and the dead carbon. So uh, this is one of the ways to sequester carbon. And the reason that, again, that we're dealing with grains is we're talking about 70% of the acreage. Well, this keeps going, but of course, the people out here in California, their ceilings are too short. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, but if, if, you know, if you rolled that out, it'd just keep going until it got to the street or somewhere. Um, so I'm going to tie this off just like I would one of our steers. That's a slip knot. Um, now, uh, so here is one of our fields of Kernza, uh, and we combine it and graze it. This, we also, of course, graze our annual wheat in the wintertime. Um, and it's a lot of places around that it's being worked with, that this is the germplasm we've sent various places. The best, I mean, the germplasm we developed the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas, the best yields are up in Minnesota, at the University of Minnesota. Um, also, Stan Cox is perennializing sorghum, a very important crop for Africa, and uh, crossing it with a wild species. Those of you that know what that species is, hold your fire and keep your mouth shut. Um, the, uh, I don't want anybody to know what it is. And don't worry about it, we're taming that species down. Okay, it's Johnson grass. Uh, but uh, we're taming down the, the species, we're not worried about it. Um, but here's an F2 population from a perennial F1. And just to show you um, the kinds of yield increases on the left, the wild perennial, some 2002 lines, 2006 lines, 2009 lines, and these represent some, uh, by planting those various lines out all at once, we're seeing that we now have performance of the perennial, and this is winter hardy too, by the way. Uh, we need to have it uh, winter hardy. All right, so where is it happening? Texas A&M, University of Georgia, University of Illinois, we have colleagues in various places. Also, uh, perennializing wheat, and Xuan Wong is um, a molecular geneticist that's um, making that happen. And uh, here you can see after harvest where you get green sprigs popping up, uh, that's a perennial. But of course, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the kind of perennial that we want. Um, you know, like 95% of those that do send up shoots end up in the, in the dumpster. Um, and so, but perennial wheat breeding, uh, Xu En Wang has now in eight different countries, 20 different um, places in eight countries where he's uh, checking this uh, germplasm against different environments. Sunflower, one of the most important oilseed cocks, David uh, Van Tassel, uh, inspired by what the Native Americans did with the annual sunflower. They took seeds, such if you look at that middle panel there, uh, small seeds, uh, increased seed size, and increased the size of the head. David Van Tassel thinks we can do that with the Maximilian sunflower, and he's making good progress on that. That's a perennial. And also, we're adding to uh, the inventory of a silphium, a uh, rosin weed that just during our last three years of drought just acts like it doesn't even care whether it's dry. It's like, bring it on. Um, but in fact, there it is on the left, uh, the uh, silphium. So uh, the, the difference between the sunflower and the silphium, it's the ray flowers uh, that are fertile and the disc flowers that are sterile in the silphium. It's the other way around. So uh, David's increasing the number of ray flowers. In other words, going to make it look more like a chrysanthemum. 
Uh, and there, there's an example of it. So where's this happening? In several places. Uh, Winnipeg, um, St. Paul, University of Illinois, and of course at the land. Rice, we're supporting the perennialization of upland rice, our colleagues there. Uh, this isn't paddy rice, although they're seeing the virtues of the perennial, partly because it frees up uh, women and uh, because they're the ones that do most of the work in the paddy rice. And women empowerment is one of the things that serves as an incentive for reducing population. This is where it begins to tie all this together. Uh, but the, uh, we just had five scientists from China that are working with the, the perennials in China um, uh, visit the land for five days while well, they were in the U.S. for a total of ten. So a couple of our guys go over there every year and they report back that they're really making good progress on that. Uh, and here shows some of our colleagues in China. Well, here's the kind of hillsides that they have and it's the places between the terraces where they'll rip out the vegetation and then maybe get a crop for a couple of years. The soil erosion is so bad. Uh, so uh, this has become important as far as the Chinese government's concerned. But it's only in a very small area in the Yunnan Academy of Ag Sciences. Uh, corn. Corn's been the primary killer of our continent. And uh, uh, there's only two places that it's happening. If, if we could get the funding, we would start in Mexico with that perennial corn that's there, and then just start working our way north with it. I figure it'll take 40 or 50 years to do that. But, by the way, that is in the short time frame for solving our problems. We're not gonna solve the population problem that fast. We're not gonna solve global warming that fast. Suddenly, our work is in the category of short solutions. You know, 20, 30, 40 year solutions. And now, uh, but so far we've just talked about the breeding. <coughs> we've got to start growing these crops in polyculture. So here is the Kernza grain that's being grown and then the legume uh, that fixes the nitrogen. And this is very important because the most important invention of the 20th century was in 1909. Two Germans, Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch learned how to turn atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia. Now, pay attention. <laughs> Legumes will fix nitrogen at four-fifths of one atmosphere, working with the rhizobia at ambient temperature. Haber-Bosch is 350 atmospheres and 400 degrees C. Or the other way around, doesn't matter. So we're talking about an agriculture with efficiencies inherent within the natural integrities. Haber-Bosch is dependent upon, upon natural gas as the feedstock. Could be done with electricity. So we got to start thinking about nature's wisdom versus human cleverness and have enough humility, humility to buy into it. More than the kind of humility that comes over you from spilling gravy on your tie. <laughs> so where is this beginning to happen? In different places around the country, people are getting gripped. Now, we've had polycultures before with the annuals. That's all good. And, by the way, as far as the vegetables are concerned, you know, the root crops, that's okay. We don't need to deal with that. But if we want to get a hold of the biggie, we've got to deal with the grains. Now, just to give you a feeling for the energy inputs required to grow annual no-till wheat and perennial hay in central Kansas, just look at the perennial grass versus the no-till annual. So, I'm about to end. When we were gatherers and hunters, we were embedded within the natural ecosystem. We invented fire. That probably did a lot to kill, especially 
worm parasites that were in the vegetables and the meat. Uh, and then, of course, what happened is that helped keep the predators away. So the predators getting us from the inside and the predators from the outside, fire was a big factor. But then when we started scratching the ground and ripping up, uh, then you end up with traditional agriculture that is moving away from being isomorphic with the way a nature system works. And then industrial agriculture got out of phase uh, even more, and sustainable agriculture kind of tweaks away at it, but it's really not getting at it. It's not getting at sustainability any more than squiggly light bulbs and Priuses are getting at sustainable agriculture. And for this reason, it's because of Jevons' paradox. Y'all folks, know, anybody out here that, uh, no, well, I know that there'll be some of you, how do I do this? How many of you know Stevens, Jevons' paradox? Not enough. Uh, here's the story. William Stanley Jevons, 1865, doing a thoroughgoing study. This is industrial England now, 100 years found that as industrial England got more efficient, industrial England used more resources, particularly coal and iron. To think we're going to efficiency our way out of this problem, to talk about carbon caps without rationing is naive. You say, I'm going to put a cap on carbon. That'll serve as an incentive. The big question is, how do you keep money out of carbon trouble? Governments, even, how do they keep it out of carbon trouble? This is going to require a great growing up on our part. And so, as I've said to my good friend Amory Lovings for years, Let's put a cap on carbon on the mines, the wellheads, the port of entry. Then let's see how good our technology can be. Enforced restraint. Yeah, somebody ought to start the clapping here for a little bit. So here we are now with industrial agriculture. We got so-called sustainable agriculture. That was a digression, and I apologize, but not much. Uh, but it's possible for us to have natural systems agriculture because we can start pulling that knowledge off the shelf out of that broad discipline of ecology and evolutionary biology. Get this, 1980, National Science Foundation started putting money into what they called long-term ecological research sites, forests, prairies, marshes, and so on. They spent millions of dollars understanding how those natural ecosystems work. It sits up there on the shelf, largely unused. But now that can begin, that multi-millions of dollars of investment can be pulled down to our campuses. And now that we can begin to imagine these perennials and think about pulling all this uh, this investment together. It was largely accumulated to understand how the world is. But as a side, it's how the world works. And so, Bruegel's 1865, the percentage of that landscape that's devoted to grains, the trees that are on that landscape are apples and pears and they're limbed up to let the light in for the grains. Well, here's an image that comes out of the industrial mind. That was National Geographic, not about 1970. And, uh, you know, there's the airplane spraying, and there are people that run the whole farm from inside the house. And, uh, you know, and there's the confinement operation um, with no acknowledgement of the density of carbon that's necessary to make that happen and what the consequences will be in terms of climate. Well, we've supported graduate fellows for several years, smart people, anybody that was doing a PhD uh, thesis that had something to do with our so-called worldview. We gave them money. Where did they get jobs? 1862, 
moral act, opening up the land of the continent through the Homestead Act. Then comes 1887 and the Experiment Station and 1914 extension. The whole thing is geared to the successes that we've had with the usual crops and cropping systems and our whole cleverness approach is predicated on those fundamentals that come right out of 1600 and Bacon and Descartes and that whole revolution in which there's an increasing reductive approach to agriculture. Right now, what do we have? Two molecules that contribute to the reduction in soil erosion. It's called Roundup and Roundup Ready. <laughs> Rather than to go upward in the hierarchy to the ecosystem as the conceptual tool. So here are these young people vibrating, wanting to get going. Where are the jobs? So they're like Copernicans in a Ptolemy system, <laughs> forced into cooking up epicycles without dealing with Kepler's elliptical orbits and bringing on a whole different way of being. And so I'll end with this. Several years ago, a friend of mine, John Todd, called and wanted to know if I'd give a talk. I said, sure. He says, well, can you give me a title? I said, sure. Herbaceous, perennial, seed-producing, polycultures, their contribution to the solution of all marital problems and the end of the possibility of nuclear holocaust. <laughs> and there was a long pause. And he said, well, you need a projector. <laughs> so my friends, in the great state of California, where I spent some wonderful times, and, and, and I got a wife out of it, too. Uh, this is the number one state in terms of bucks for agriculture. You folks have to take the lead and support the 50-year farm bill that we've taken to Washington. And if you don't do that, I'm never coming back again. Thank you. <laughs>